All right. Well, it is noon here, Happy Valley time. That must mean it's time for the virtual speaker series presented by the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome everybody. I see the Zoom room is filling up. As always, we'd love to know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. You can drop that information in the chat at the bottom of your Zoom video window. Or if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can put that in the comments. We have a great presentation for you this afternoon. We are welcoming Gabriel, Gabrielle Foreman and Jim Casey. They are the co-editors of the first full-length book of the 50 years to address 19th century black convention movement, the precursor to the NAACP. A great presentation coming to you in just a couple minutes. Again, welcome to the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. Again, let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. Go ahead and drop that information in the chat. We have a great presentation lined up for you. Thanks for joining us on the Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. We'll be getting started in just a minute. I see Midge Kennedy joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Good afternoon, Midge. Welcome to the virtual speaker series. I see Crystal Smithmeyer as well in Patton, Pennsylvania, Penn State alum. Welcome, Crystal. We have a great presentation lined up. Thank you all so much for participating. We're going to let the Zoom room fill up a little bit here before we get started. I see my colleague, Danae Blasso, joining us from Liberal Arts and Arlene Wilson from the University of Delaware. Welcome to the Blue Hens who are tuning in today from the University of Delaware. I see Aaron Gorlick from uh, Rochester area, Henrietta, New York, and Chris Hort joining us from right here in University Park as well, the College of the Liberal Arts. Welcome everybody. We'll be getting started in just a minute. Thanks for tuning in. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of the Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You may also customize your caption view by clicking the stream to text link in the chat. We're live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas and audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Gabrielle Foreman and Jim Casey. They are the co-editors of the first full length book in 50 years to address the 19th century black convention movement the precursor to the NAACP. They'll talk about 
why so few people know about this early Black-led movement for civil rights. These two co-directors of the Colored Conventions Project will share how this award-winning project came to be housed at Penn State's new Center for Black Digital Research, and we'll discuss the holiday they've resurrected, Douglas Day, which is now yearly which is now a yearly global transcribathon of Black historical records. Dr. Gabriel For Gabriel Foreman is the founding faculty director of the award-winning Colored Conventions Project and professor of English, African American Studies, and History at Penn State, where she holds the Paterno Family Chair of Liberal Arts. She co-directs the new Center for Digital Black Research and works with a cross-institutional team of 30 graduate student leaders, librarians, postdocs, visiting faculty, undergraduate researchers, and arts and community partners. She is the author of five books and editions, which include most recently, The Colored Conventions Movement, Black Organizing in the 19th Century, and Praise Songs for the David Potter Art and Pottery for David Drake, for, which is forthcoming. In 2022, she'll be the Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the American Antiquarian Society. Also with us today is Jim Casey, he is an assistant research professor of African American Studies and managing director of the Senator of the Center for Black Digital Research here at Penn State. He earned his PhD from the University of Delaware and held a fellowship at the Center for Digital Humanities at Princeton University. He is co-editor with Gabrielle of the Colored Conventions Movement: Black Organizing in the 19th Century. He is the vice president and president elect of the Research Society for American periodicals. Recent publications and ongoing projects focus on critical data studies, archives, and crowdsourcing. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gabrielle and Jim to the virtual speaker session. Thank you for having us. And thank you so much too, to everyone who took uh, the time to come today. Jim, do you wanna say something before we uh, move to the slides? We're delighted to be here. It's our first full year of being here at Penn State, and we're just uh, really eager to get to know more of the folks across this alumni network that we've heard so much about. All right, I'm going to go to the slides, so give me just one moment if you'd be so kind. There we go. Oh, let me go back a couple. It wants to go back. There we go. All right. Um, this is the first edited collection ever on the Colored Conventions Movement, which we'll introduce you to in a moment. And we hope that most people who um, like uh, the vast majority of uh, not only people who are um, college educated, but people who aren't college educated, people who have graduate degrees in lots of different um, fields most people did not know about the conventions movement. So when we think about the abolition movement, there's scores and scores of books. Um, they take up bookcases in libraries all over, but this is the first edited collection. Um, and we are really glad to be able to tell you a little bit about the convention movement itself and how we've been um, able to join a team that has resurrected this movement and brought it to digital life for a whole generation of um, scholars and what we call uh, residents and citizen um, organizers and activists and uh, learners. Half the essays in this book are accompanied by interactive exhibits that you can find at coloredconventions.org. And this is, I think, really, you know, so one of the questions that we hear most frequently is why didn't I know about this movement, particularly when it lasted for seven decades and included tens of thousands of delegates um, and hundreds of thousands of participants, we believe, people who came out to the speeches um, and came out to the multi-day meetings, which Jim will talk about a little bit more in a moment. We do know this history, the history of anti-slavery, but the Color Conventions movement itself begins three years before the American Anti-Slavery Society, the antebellum anti-slavery movement organizes itself. 
before the liberator, for example, before William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips come to the fore as leaders of the um, abolition movement. Indeed, the color convention movement spawns and uh, influences the uh, anti-slavery movement as much or more than the other way around. Again, this history that we know usually situates black activists, almost all of whom in the anti-slavery movement who we call abolitionists were involved for decades in the, anti, in, the, in the color convention movement itself. So these are the photos we see of the soul and the singular African-American who is usually sponsored by, um, African, um, by um, white abolitionists, by Quakers who are, have often been seen as the leaders. This has changed, I think, in the last 15 years of scholarship. But in the public imagination, um, we still tend to think about Black activists and abolitionists as isolated um, from each other um, and as being influenced by um, white leaders um, and by uh, white organizers and religious groups such as the Quakers. Freedom's Journal, the first Black newspaper, um, which was launched in New York before slavery's end in the state in 1827, was uh, predates the Liberator by four years. Um, and it's, uh, one of its editors becomes active in the color conventions movement as well. Jim's going to talk to us a little bit about how these multi-day meetings were organized, where they were held, how many years they uh, went on, and um, what they discussed as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jim. Thanks, uh, Gabrielle. Uh, so nice to see everyone today. This is one of those places where we're gonna just talk about the very top tip of the iceberg. Um, we spent the last 10 years relearning, rediscovering a lot of these histories, uh, which sort of roughly, most generally speaking, start at about 1830 and continue through the end of the 19th century. So that's 70 years in which free and formerly enslaved Black communities all across the United States, initially in the North, but then all across the entire country, oftentimes would recognize that the sort of cause of social justice, the need for advocating on their own behalf in both political, social, and economic arenas required Black communities to come together to debate what their larger efforts might be and how they might coordinate their efforts across different cities, across different states, and even across different regions. And so the sort of rough template would be that a group of leaders would get together, discuss the issues, and then they would issue a call and ask communities in different places to send delegates to represent their interests and convey their ideas in larger gatherings like the one that you see pictured here. These movements began in the antebellum movement, uh, excuse me, with national meetings in Philadelphia here in Pennsylvania, um, but quickly spread across many different states. And if we can go to the next slide, oh, I think she's, <laughs> um, we can see here, this is a, a very sort of general timeline. We can see, again, just to reiterate that point about why it's such a partial view to understand these only as part of the anti-slavery movement that nominally ends with the Civil War, when we actually have this huge spike after the Civil War. It's obvious enough when we say it out loud, right? All of a sudden, millions of newly emancipated Black men, women, and children could attend the conventions all across the United States South and pushing further West. And so we're still in the process of recovering this work. We've begun to find records of these in more than 100 different libraries and archives and repositories. And we're sure that there's a huge amount more. Our latest guess, I think, puts it somewhere just south of 600 state and national and regional conventions involving at least 10 or 11,000 Black men and women, right? So this is a mass, mass movement that involves so many people that we've been working with a huge group of people that we're going to talk about in a moment to really try and sort of understand in the larger context. When Jim talks about 10, um, 10, 10,000 people who participated, he means as delegates. But when we move from the podium to the pews and from the pews to the neighborhoods of the places where people were coming from to participate in the convention movement and in the conventions themselves, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We have um, 2,000, 3,000 people coming out to speeches by people like John Mercer Langston. John Mercer Langston is one of the, was from the family, um, the Langston family, who was the first family to go to Oberlin College, to graduate from Oberlin College. His brother Charles, whose signature is at the bottom of this petition here, was one of those first graduates. 
And John Burson likes to become the first black dean of um, Howard Law School, and then a congressman, a US congressman from the state of Virginia as well. He and his brother together went to more than 20 conventions over four decades, perhaps even more. And he began when he was a teenager, um, when he was 19 and, 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 and rose to leadership alongside Frederick Douglass um, uh, as one of the real leaders. Charles Langston, um, who is also one of the lions of the convention movement, is the grandfather of Langston Hughes. So you see how the political activism moves through generations into cultural production, into cultural richness of the work that was being done in the conventions themselves. We also have a, a man named Othello Burghardt, who is one of the lesser lights of the 1847 convention. Um, and he's here with people like William Wells Brown um, and William Cooper Nell. William Cooper Nell integrates the schools in, um, in Boston. Um, and uh, William Wells Brown is the first African-American uh, novelist in the United States. Uh, the people on this list are the lions of the 19th century, almost all male, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, then there is Othello Burghardt, who is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's grandfather at the 47 convention. These uh, delegates, um, are the leading ministers, the leading editors, um, the leading professors um, of the antebellum period. And when we reach the Civil War and Reconstruction, um, and they join state legislatures, they join national legislatures. And these are the caricatures that we see on the left here of African Americans when they're joining political leadership in the United States, caricatured and demeaned. Um, uh, almost always uh, characterized as if they didn't have any political experience. But many of them came out of a, 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 a very ritualized and extraordinarily established movement um, that was a parallel politics um, when they had been excluded from the larger uh, public square and body politic. But they were using uh, say, um, some very similar um, conventions of the conventions, as we say, um, things that were like Rob, the Robert Rules of Order of their day. Um, and they were very familiar with the political strategizing, the political conventions, the oratory, the legislative um, and um, political terrain um, through which they had fought for educational rights, for labor rights, for voting and jury rights and for freedom from state sanctioned violence um, and the ignoring of the targeting of African-American communities. We should note, for example, that the convention movement begins when 2000 um, uh, citizens from Ohio are run out of the state based on black laws that had not been uh, interrogated for or used for many, many years and were reinvigorated um, in the 1830s and 18, late 1820s. And in 1829, uh, Ohioans in the then the West, um, uh, uh, not the South here, we're talking about 2000 Ohio, Black Ohioans um, who uh, uh, have, to, have to go uh, to Canada when they're faced with the violence of the state um, and state sanctioned violence, which is also um, um, ignored. So um, by then they have a lot of experience um, in, um, by, excuse me, by the 1860s, they have a lot of experience. This book comes out of a really um, large and collective um, group of people who have been doing this work together in order to resurrect the records and the minutes um, and the newspaper coverage of the convention movement itself. Uh, and the acknowledgments is a who's who of really not building a book, but building a way for uh, general audiences and scholars to be able to explore a history that um, has scattered records and has been largely ignored um, by uh, the, the larger body of scholarship and by public imaginations. Jim, I'm gonna hand this back over to you. Sure, uh, and I'm, uh pleased to announce that our 
website which shares many of these materials which had experienced some uh, server issues overnight is now back alive and functional uh, as of a few moments ago. Uh, a big part of the reason why we didn't know this movement was the scholarship that had asked us to look in different places, but a big part of it was also practical reasons. As I mentioned before, their conventions were held in dozens of different states, were oftentimes focused and embedded within local communities, which meant that records of these conventions stayed in those local communities. Um, and that means that we've had to do a lot of kind of groundwork, working with a lot of people to sort of wear out the, the virtual and actual shoe leather, finding the materials to be able to bring them together digitally using technology to reunify a collection that had been scattered since the beginning. And so as you see here is a, a page which describes some of the digitized records that we've begun to bring together at colorconventions.org that's gonna allow people for the very first time to be able to read many of these documents in context with each other to be able to conduct keyword searches, to look for family members, to use computational means to analyze the larger movements and understand how these activist networks have developed over time. One of the things that it, for example, has been able to show us is just how much the postbellum movement was an absolute explosion of political participation by African-Americans all across the United States South and across the West and, and a sort of revival in, in the New England and, Northern states. These are just some of the many conventions you see from places. I think it's fair to say that if you're somewhere in the country, there's likely a convention that was probably held in an area near you. There were at least eight or 10 of them held, for example, in Pennsylvania over the decades. Um, we think that there's actually a significant number more uh, that we're working on uh, acclimating and, and locating for ourselves as well. The real importance of these beyond just that we're able to find them and be able to read them together is that we see a real attention to de democracy, to democratic practice in moments when the Civil War had just ended and people were trying to write new state constitutions, were trying to figure out how to build new communities for themselves in the newly emancipated Southern states. A real focus on some of the par parts that when you first read them can be slightly sort of tedious seeming, right? Some of these documents, they spend page after page taking roll calls and passing votes about procedures. And the reason that those are so important is because they were there specifically to attend to some of the promises of democracy that had been in some of our country's founding documents, but had been completely held out of their lives and immediate lived experiences. And so we'd encourage you, especially to go look at some of these conventions for moments of hope and trauma and sometimes fierce tensions where we knew that, you know, these black communities were not monoliths, but really had these very vibrant debates about voting rights, about schools, about how the churches might help build some of these communities together. Um, clearly, there's so much for us to talk about. Uh, so rather than sort of go on endlessly uh, as we enjoy doing, uh, I'll pass it back to Gabrielle to talk about some of the huge number of people who have helped us to recover so much of these materials. We like to think about the ways in which we can mirror the energy and commitments of the conventions themselves by creating collectives um, that honor the work of the collective that did this work. I think one of the things that the convention movement really brings to the fore is the um, foundational paradigms of collectivity rather than individualism as a means of group success and individual success of modeling um, how people can get their rights. This is um, really a movement for collective rights rather than individual rights. And uh, we think very often in literary studies of um, the slave narrative as being, again, the, the model of Black writing. But here we see people writing in collectives. So we have resurrected this work in collectives as well. Uh, the team that we have brought to Penn State as we start the Center for Black Digital Research here and the Color Conventions Project is one of those the three projects with the Douglas Day um, and also the Early Black Women's Organizing Archive. Um, it, it, it really is based on work done by undergraduate researchers, by graduate student leaders, by librarians. We have arts partnerships and people who are doing work in dance and theater and murals that uh, are going up in Philadelphia uh, to document the movement. But we're really interesting in, interested in the ways in which not only archives, um, are the purveyors and distributors 
um, of, of knowledge about the past. But where does history live? Does it also live in the arts? Does it also, also live in the classroom? We've got um, some uh, te a curriculum committee that uh, is working with high school teachers, for example, to create curricula, a digital exhibits committee that has interactive exhibits, again, half of which um, accompany essays in the book. Um, and these are some of the people who have been involved um, in the project itself. I should also say that we've worked with scores um, of uh, North American teaching partners um, who teach the curriculum that we have created um, in their classes and that they also have helped us to resurrect records to create exhibits. So we really think of this and in fact, those uh, teaching partners are across North America as the conventions themselves were. So we, we really are trying again to mirror the commitments um, and the structures of the conventions themselves. Um, again, we're also very committed to open access so that you can get all of these records online. The original um, uh, volumes which collected the convention minutes um, only go to the 1860s, um, 1860 and 1865, the state and the, and the national conventions are collected there. And the one that had just 12 national conventions once sold on Amazon for more than $3,000. Um, we once had a team member who lost um, the, the dog-eared uh, version of one of uh, the chair of the department. And we were so scared because we knew we couldn't replace it because it was so expensive. Um, we did indeed find it and replaced it, but um, now they are free. And as Jim said, we've um, quadrupled and more the number of records. I mean, really quite more. So here is uh, just a little bit about our, our um, color conventions curriculum. We have library research guides, which are used by librarians across the country. Here are some of our North American teaching partners who have uh, taken on some of the collective work of uh, finding conventions again, um, of creating exhibits that are interactive. Um, I point to the California exhibit, the Ohio exhibit, the ex exhibit on the black press, all created by our North American teaching partners. These exhibits do really interesting work and ask interesting questions like, where did the delegates stay? What routes did they travel? What kinds of petitions did the conventions produce? What kinds of songs did they sing as they were starting the convention? So we have biographies of the delegates um, here, but we also have interactive maps that take you to coverage, newspaper coverage of some of the conventions or show you where the churches actually were embedded in the neighborhoods. We ask the question, where did they stay and what did they eat and take you to interactive menus and to um, uh, some of the blueprints of the homes and the boarding houses and show you some of the advertisements of the boarding houses and um, that where convention goers stayed because many of them could not stay in hotels, right? In, in a segregated US. Um, at that moment, for example. Some of these essays too, for example, where did they stay, what did they eat, are in the book itself. We had transcription um, and, and a transcription effort actually that Jim, I'm gonna ask you since you helped lead it to talk a little bit about um, instead, of, uh, and then you can hand it back to me. Sure, let me uh, find the unmute button. Uh, one of the challenges when we work with these historical records is that we find the physical copies or find copies that have been digitized that aren't always all that easy to use. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to flip through 3,000 pages on a PDF. It's not super easy to find things, even compared to some books on a shelf. And so what we've needed to do is really augment the digital records that we've begun to acquire by exposing them for crowdsourcing, asking many of the people who are part of the historic living black communities to help us transcribe the documents through some of the interfaces that we've built and are gonna continue to build uh, so that we can make these much easier to search in the ways that we're used to using on, on Google or Google Books or something like that. Um, the end result is that we had something like 1500 transcribers help us transcribe several thousand pages that became significantly easier to use on some of the um, platforms that you see here. And we uh, started with this transcribe project, which we partnered with the AME Church also to do. Um, and so, because so many of the conventions them themselves, including the first one at Mother Bethel in Philadelphia, 
were held at AME churches, but they were also held in halls. Um, and this one, for example, that you're taking a look at was was held in this, I think the city hall in Tennessee. And am I right, Jim? I think that's, I think that is right. Um, and, um, and, and we moved on to do work on Douglas Day, which I'm gonna ask Jim to talk about. Oops. Well, we also won, well, let me do this. We also won an, an MLA, a modern language, so a whole bunch of awards along the way. And this is a photo of the group itself, including librarians, graduate students, um, who um, uh, partook in, in one of the, the awards that we were um, honored and humbled to have received. Douglas Day. Sure, uh, and here you see just some of our uh, lovely collaborators as well. Um, the process of opening up this work to more than just people who come to uh, work every day on a college campus, or I suppose virtually now, really, opened our eyes to the real possibility and the exciting potential for including many more people in helping to create these digital resources, not just as you know, sort of broadcasting to a larger audience about some of these important histories, but actually inviting people in to help shape how we begin to re recreate, relearn about, and preserve many of these histories. And so over the past couple of years and continuing, uh, we celebrate something called Douglas Day, which uh, is an annual program every February 14th, so it's Valentine's Day, uh, which also happens to be the birthday that Frederick Douglass's family celebrated for many years, uh, his birth. Of course, he didn't know his biological birth date. Um, but as Douglass Day becomes one of the real origins of what we know today, today as Black History Month, it began as something where Black communities would come together and create sort of spaces for historical remembering, spaces for creating different kinds of monuments and ways of learning about the past. And so starting in 2017 through this year, we've partnered with lots of different organizations with Douglas Day, uh, including the CCP, including the Library of Congress this past year, Howard, Howard's Moreland Spingard Library, among many others, uh, to invite thousands and thousands of people to help create new digital resources for, start, for studying, learning, and teaching about Black history. This coming year, we're gonna be reviving some of the work um, that we've done with the Color Conventions Project. So uh, if you're interested, please stay tuned, follow us on social media to get some of the updates um, about the new Color Conventions crowdsourcing project that's coming down the pike very soon and very soon. Um, and I should say also too as well, the important part about many of these is not just that we can sort of create new resources to sort of learn about more information, but that it's partly for us important to change the ways in which we engage with many of these histories. Oftentimes it can be very somber, very serious moments of sort of some of the darkest parts of this nation's history. But there's also moments when we learn about the conventions and about some of the other organizing circuits in the 19th century that were spaces for joy, for having fun, you know? And so when we celebrate a birthday party, we really mean it. We get birthday cakes everywhere. We have a, a new uh, bake-off contest inspired by all of the pandemic baking where people bake birthday cakes with Frederick Douglass and other people's faces um, and really go to town. So when you plan for February 14th next year, make sure to get all your recipes together. Um, we saw some incredibly stiff competition uh, for some really extraordinary cakes uh, that if you visit our social media, you'll also be able to see. Um, and this is a, a program that we've already got plans in place to continue for many years to come because we know how important it is to sort of disembed the historian or the professor as the only expert in the room, but to really invite more and more people in to help us create these histories together. One of the things that we make sure that we do when we um, partner with places like uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture and Library of Congress, and now coming back to do our own records next year is also to emphasize black women's work. Uh, you might have noted that so many of the delegates were male. We've decided as a project that it's really important for us to center black women's history because black women were the infrastructure builders. We see them in anonymized records. Um, we see them as the ladies who uh, did the fundraising and created the food and created the housing structure. Let's think for a moment about what it means to have thousands of people come into town or to, um, to, to, to engage in the work of a convention. You've got scores and scores of delegates who need to be housed and fed. Um, and in the interstices, the places where it says, break after the afternoon session, 
we're interested in imagining and not only imagining, documenting what it is that was being done there and what happens before a convention and after a convention. These are the questions of any kind of organizing history, right? So what is the infrastructure that is built beforehand and which is carried out afterward? And this is largely done with the labor and the expertise of Black women. So through um, MOUs or memos of understanding with our teaching partners, through our call for proposals um, for uh, the work and the programming that we do, um, through our emphasis on the records of people like Mary Ann Shad Carey, who was the first Black, what is known as the first Black woman editor of a newspaper in North America, is the first Black woman to enroll in law school in the United States organized for women's voting rights and for Black people's voting rights, dignity, education, and journalism. Um, through our focus on these people's work and legacies, um, we're centering Black women in the work that we know they already did, but that were largely ignored by the records that were created at the moment. Here's one of the many spreadsheets. Jim, do you want to do this? And then we'll then we'll 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 get real quick so we can get to some questions and answers. Yeah, uh, we track each and every mention, allusion, in between the line, uh, reference to any of the roles that women played. In part because we're needing to teach ourselves how to listen in for many of the spaces, the in between the lines, the behind the scenes sort of roles that Black women often played, um, that are reflected only in minor ways in the minutes. But when we begin to trace more and more of the clues and pull on those threads. Uh, we find, of course, that there was much more uh, than the documents themselves actually reveal. Here is also some of the work that centers um, Black women's activism and when they show up as delegates or speakers in the conventions themselves. We find people like Frances Harper, who is one of the most beloved poets of the 19th century and one of the most prolific novelists, is presenting um, at multiple conventions from Ohio through Syracuse at national and state conventions. And Sam DeVera, one of our leaders, has done um, lots of work on that. We're also really interested um, in the social networks of influence um, and travel that sometimes um, it really makes sense to be able to visualize in order to be, a to be able to see the work. And this is one reason a digital project with interactive um, um, uh, exhibits um, and the ability to visualize the data allows us to ask different questions. This is Jim's visualization. It comes from his essay in the book or accompanies it. So Jim. Sure, uh, and, and this is also you know, part of one of those ongoing streams of work where we know that collaborating with our friends in the information sciences and computer sciences can help us develop methods to really understand the breadth of these movements. This is a visualization, visualizing some of the social networks, uh, if you can imagine it, of the delegates who are attending conventions and building organizations together, uh, which sort of reiterates and reinforces some of the points that we had made about the ways in which the scholarship had conflated things that were really fairly distinct sorts of communities. And so you see here, um, just one of the main records of the Underground Railroad, one of the huge sort of cornerstone collections for studying the anti-slavery movement from the Boston Public Library. And matching and cross-referencing all of the names gives us a graph that looks something like this. Uh, this is one of the things that we're gonna be increasingly working with to understand the interrelations of the conventions with, for example, black newspapers, black churches, um, but also using things like perhaps machine learning to understand some of the ways that these sort of vast collections of documents might be able to tell us more about how the convention sort of brought themselves together as collective bodies. We want to note that this is one of the really understudied um, places of African American history in the 19th century is um, because the records of um, white leaders were preserved. Um, uh, we really do know a lot more about their relationships to the black folks who were also in their circuit and in their circles. But when we have people who were traveling together for 40 years um, who were influencing each other and discussing some of the major issues of the day who are organizing together for voting rights, for jury rights, for political rights, for economic rights, um, for educational access and justice. Um, when we have people who have been discussing this together, who are having um, arguments about strategy and tactics, um, who are having disagreements um, and figuring out how to come together nonetheless 
um, in order to lobby um, state legislatures and, um, and the nation who are figuring out how to put their needs um, and their rights in front of the people who have the power to execute um, and to include um, or to hold people accountable when they refuse to include African Americans, um, both before and after the Civil War, um, before and after slavery, before and after they have voting rights and political rights taken away from them in the North before the Civil War, where uh, Blacks could only vote in five states in the entire United States before the Civil War. Free Blacks, we're not talking about enslaved people, free Blacks, right, have been disenfranchised by states um, in the North um, before the Civil War. When you have this organizational effort and influence, then you have an interlocking set of relationships that have been extraordinarily um, underexplored. And we're really hoping, and we do know, um, that the scholarship that emerges both from the book, this first edited collection, but also from the website and all of the information and records on it will spawn uh, new kinds of knowledge, new books, new explorations, new curricula for high schools, um, new art and poetry um, over the next decades. So here again is the book. It is under $20 at UNC Press if anybody is interested in learning more. And please also visit us at coloredconventions.org or transcribe with us during Douglas Day. You can find us at douglasday.org um, and follow us at Twitter on Twitter at CCP underscore.org and Ditch Black. Thank you guys so much. We're looking forward to your questions and your comments. Um, and again, we thank you for spending some of your afternoon today with us. Excellent. Well, if you have a question for Jim or Gabrielle, we can take those questions. Uh, there is one that has come in <clears throat> on the initial one. And this is this is extensive. So I'm, I'm going to ask it in in parts. So um, first, they want to know who were the. Um, let me see here. Where uh, who were the original presenters at the conventions? Um, did they have delegates representing organizations or regions? Were Robert's Rules of Order used? Like, how were they? What did the uh, essentially? What did the agenda at these conventions look like? Jim, why don't you go? Uh, sure. Uh, it's a great question, uh, in part because it lets us point at some of the very cool work uh, that folks have done. Um, on our exhibit, or excuse me, on our website, you can find one of many exhibits, one of which actually discusses the attention to the political rituals, the sort of parliamentary procedures that help to run many of the conventions, um, based on a chapter written by Erica Ball in the volume, uh, but expanded um, with all kinds of additional resources that you can dive into. Um, the original conventions, which began in 1830, um, were responding, as, as Gabrielle noted, um, to some of the attempts through legal and extra legal means to expel people from the state of Ohio. And it was a, sort of spreading across the, the sort of trend, excuse me, that was spreading across the country. And so there were a couple of people actually in a few different places who put out a call that said, we really need to talk about how to have a solution that operates at more than just a local level. And so one of the earliest was a man named Hezekiah Grice, uh, who was a sort of shipping entrepreneur, businessman um, in Baltimore, who first put out an initial call, which coincided with a series of conversations that had been swirling around in Philadelphia, led in part by Richard, Bishop Richard Allen, one of the founders of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, in connection with Mother Bethel Church, of course, which is still there. Um, and then there was also groups in uh, New York who were also talking about how to bring together black activism to address some of the anti-black racism laws and, and trends that were going across the country. And so it was a number of these different groups who gathered at some of the earliest conventions starting in 1830, some of which we'll note first met in secret for a couple of days so that they could carefully sort of plan out how they would present many of these discussions, knowing that when they were stepping out into the public stage, they were taking a risk, right? Looking back at many of these conventions today, it can seem very kind of procedural and sort of matter of fact, but what we miss just reading the documents by themselves is how much of a sort of bold and, and sort of courageous move it was for many of these people to stand up at a podium and demand their free and equal rights. And so at some of these early conventions, what we see are folks, instead of speaking out as individuals, 
working in committees. There would be committees on the rules for running the convention. There was a committee at many of the conventions for preparing an address. And that address, I would encourage, uh, excuse me, those addresses are one of the great places for people to start sort of diving into some of these records, in right. part because many of them would present some of the platforms that had been discussed and voted on at the conventions in two different but parallel ways. Sometimes they would write an address to the people of the United States, sort of generally, but anticipating sort of white politicians as the main audience. But then they would also write another address to the people of color of the United States or of a particular state, where they would talk about some of the process and some of the work that they had sort of devised together to advocate and to push for many of those ideas. And so what we can see here is some sort of very careful balancing across many of the conventions. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the additional sort of saving qualities, if you were to go look at, for example, at the 1843 National Convention, um, was that they voted on lots and lots of different things. Their sort of commitment to democracy was not just lip service, but they would propose usually a set of resolutions, then they would have debates, and people would really be, you know, in the ways that we're used to watching maybe now, you know, in the US Congress and the Senate, they would debate, you know, changing a particular word, changing a particular phrasing, knowing that they needed to represent the interests and the safety and the, the well being of their communities. And so in the 1843 convention, for example, the great minister, orator, editor, Henry Helen Garnett stands up and gives a speech where he, he effectively says, better to fight and die. Um, as a free man than to live enslaved. And right. it's effectively, in so many words, sort of calling on enslaved people to sort of organize and, and rise up in resistance to their enslavement across the South. Um, it was a bold speech and it was fiercely debated. People went on for days debating about whether or not the convention should include his address in the final published minutes and what version of it they might endorse. And there were a lot of really sort of important debates that we see at that convention, of course, that continue for many years afterwards, the convention in 1843 eventually decides by a single vote not to include his speech in the minutes. And that's in part driven by people who were living in Southern Ohio on the border with Kentucky who say, we're not willing to risk publishing such a bold statement with our names attached to it because we know that there's real public safety concerns for our communities when we are acting in, excuse me, speaking up in, in especially bold ways. And so they were really sort of careful at so many of these movements um, to think about how things would resonate just not just with a particular community, but across lots and lots of different audiences. And so part of I think what keeps us coming back to studying so many of these conventions in so many different places is trying to understand more about that process and more about the ideas that so many people brought to bear to forge a kind of larger collective body to vote and be able to sort of build a larger sort of vehicle for, for making different kinds of progress. I'm sure Gabrielle can add there yeah. too. Let's go ahead to another question. Yeah, well, speaking of the public safety concerns, what was the reaction or opposition from, uh, from white America at that time to these conventions? That's a really good question. Um, and of course, they're, they're taking place in lots of different locations over 70 years. So there's no one answer to what is the response to, of, of, of white communities. Jim already talked a little bit about the only uh, convention that was held in a slaveholding state in Maryland um, in the antebellum period, where they literally met uh, for several days beforehand in secret, uh, before they actually met. And there was so much violence that, set, that, that delegates left the actual state. Uh, in Georgia, um, people like Henry McNeil Turner uh, are testifying in front of Congress about the fact that they take things out of the convention minutes themselves, records of what they call murders and murder and outrages. There are murder and outrage committees um, because they're worried about the backlash of the Ku Klux Klan in the late 60s, 1860s. So you have different kinds of violences, uh, of violence happening across different locations. But we just talked about two of the Southern states or slaveholding states the violence against African Americans is real in Pennsylvania. Um, at Pennsylvania Hall, which was uh, created so that African Americans and um, anti slavery activists could organize um, in a place because churches were so scared to hold political meetings because so many had been burned down um, in the 30s and the 40s and targeted for violence. Uh, that 
um, that huge, august, beautiful building um, is burned down in Philadelphia within uh, the first week of its opening. So we're talking about violence that happens um, across the states. One of the interesting questions, Paul, is um, how are newspapers also covering the conventions? And that's one of the things um, that we do cover. Um, Henry McNeil Turner uh, calls a convention in 1893 and 500 delegates um, are reported to be at that convention. It is reported on in scores and scores of papers. So we have a data visualization um, on our exhibit that allows you to go to the different newspapers and look and read the racist coverage and the laudatory coverage, um, the uh, neutral coverage, right? You know, the, the, all of the kinds of range of responses from black and white communities that are also geographically different and dispersed um, and um, are, um, are politically motivated. So, so uh, the ways in which white um, responses um, are, uh, that's only one of the vectors. We really wanna sort of think about political responses, regional responses in intersectional ways, right? Um, yeah. as, as well. So some of the early conventions from the 1830s, I would imagine they were predominantly in the North. They were predominantly, delegates were free blacks at that time. I'm fascinated by the, the Southern conventions that happened in 1865 in particular and wondering who were the delegates at those initial conventions in the south were they abolitionists from the north were they freed blacks from the south was it a combination i'm wondering if there was some sort sort of like social carpetbaggers if you will that that came from the north to start to lead um to lead the movement or was it um, from the ground up within each of these states. Jim, can I start us off? Okay, so um, I want to I want to I want to take that in a couple of directions. Yeah. Um, one, um, we can talk about the South, and let's talk about the South in a minute. Um, it's it's a really interesting question. And Jim, make sure I get back to Talladega, right? Um, but I also wanted to 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 talk about the ways in which they travel in other unexpected places, right? So uh, we had a, a teaching partner in Iowa and they uncovered eight, well, we knew about three and they uncovered eight to 11 conventions in Iowa. So one of the things that um, Jim just suggested during the presentation is that it's really interesting to think about the ways in which the expansion of other um, black institutions foster networks that then spawn um, uh, black convention movements. And one of those is the AME church, right? So the oldest independent denomination. And so when they're moving out to places like Iowa, they're bringing editors, right? Um, and when they're moving to Indiana, they're bringing editors. When they're at, at, and they're also creating places where black folks who are um, targeted in the South are coming North, right, as well. And then going back to the South. So we might think about carpetbaggers, but we also might think about the enslaved people who ran from Virginia or right and then ended up as free people in the in um, in the north, people like Douglas, right, who um, once was enslaved, people like John Mercer Langston, who was free but was born in um, of an of, of a mother who was freed by her, um, her white planter partner. Um, who then goes back to Virginia afterwards. So the Ohio Black community is really also a Virginia Black community, much in the way that we think about Chicago as Mississippi North now, right? Right, Ohio is Virginia North in some ways. So you have people returning. You also have people sitting side by side um, with those who um, are moving after the Civil War but um, side by side with people who were once enslaved. And one of my favorite stories is about um, an Alabama convention. I believe it was in Mobile. Um, and, um, and that convention had three people who had been enslaved within six months who went. And they started talking about how they wanted to have their children educated because they had been um, hired out to a Baptist college, a local Baptist college nearby, which they had to build in order to pay the contribution 
that their enslaver actually had to contribute from the region. So he hired them out to do the work. And they went, well, we want our families to actually be able to go to churches. And they decided that they were going to found a church called, Tal excuse me, found a college called Talladega College. It's these three enslaved folks um, at, who um, were involved in the, the state convention, literally just months after they were freed, who then are um, partner with the AMA, the American Missionary Association, to buy the building they had worked on as enslaved people that fails as a college, a white college that they had been forced to labor on. And that becomes one of the buildings for Talladega College, founded by ideas at a state convention just after the Civil War. So you have mechanics, you have enslaved folks who are um, uh, laborers, we have farmers sitting side by side, people who have gone to law school at Howard and then, for example, gone down to Mississippi. Marianne Shad Carey's brother, for example, who becomes um, one of the state legislators in Mississippi. Or people like Jonathan Gibbs, who goes down and becomes the superintendent of schools in, um, in the state of Florida, who had been um, involved in conventions and antebellum convention, conventions, and whose brother Mifflin Gibbs had been involved in California conventions, and then takes his experience in both Pennsylvania and, and California conventions and becomes part of the, um, the Canadian convention movement that literally builds part of Canada's, Canada's state structures at their larger integrated convention structure. So we have this expertise in this um, structure integrating with newly freed people and, um, and being shared and built upon with the experiences and the expertise of people who have been laborers in the South and those who have had a great deal of mobility as enslaved people and as freed people um, who freed themselves before the Civil War. Jim, do you want to add to that? Not sure I can, <laughs> except to say amen. We could go on to another question. Yeah, Gabrielle, um, you mentioned five states allowing voting before the Civil War. Um, do you, would you mind mentioning which states they were? Yes, I would absolutely mind being called to the carpet on that question. I do not remember, so instead I will pivot um, and okay. talk about uh, the ways in which Pennsylvania should have been one of those states before the Civil War. So before the, the mid-1830s, free Black people had the right to um, vote in the state of Pennsylvania. And in 1837, I'm almost positive, that law is overturned at a state can, um, at, a, at, at, at a Pennsylvania state convention, not a color convention, a Pennsylvania constitutional convention. And African Americans then organize and write collectively in order to um, advocate um, to get their the franchise back unsuccessfully for years and years and years. So one of the things I think that we don't account for is the turning back of um, black rights that begins in the late 30s and moves through the 50s. So that you have a lot of free people, for example, who are not allowed to leave the state um, if they want to come back in the 1850s in places like Maryland. In Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana, Blacks are not allowed in the state in the 1850s. And then obviously there's the fugitive slave law in, the, in 1850 itself. Um, and then the constraining set of rights that accompany the fugitive slave law that culminate in, um, in Dred Scott, which of course declares that Blacks have no rights that whites are bound to respect. Free people, as well as enslaved people, flee the country at that moment. And one of the things we haven't said today is how resonant the very struggles of the people who we document, their uh, sacrifices, their expertise, their oratorical brilliance, their organizing tactics, how much the, the, the issues that they um, are organizing around resonate with us today, that we are still organizing for educational access and justice 
that we are still organizing for voting rights, that we are still talking about jury rights, right? So that, these, that we are still talking about labor issues and fair pay and equity. Um, these are the very issues that they were dealing with. And they were asking the question of what it means if the country is not able to fully integrate Black people and treat them as citizens with the dignity, respect, the full integration and enjoyment of the rights that others enjoy, right? Which includes uh, uh, wealth and medicine, right? Access to the things that make us quote unquote, right? One of the first world nations in this country. What does it mean if black people are denied access um, to, to the very body um, of political rights that others enjoy? Yeah, I, I think it's fascinating. This is almost 150, to, maybe two, close to 200 years ago. And the agendas at these conventions are still topics that are on the agenda of Black America today, right? We're talking about maybe in, in, in a different way, but we're talking about voting rights and civil rights and, and all the things that you just mentioned um, are, are still the topics that, that we're talking about. Um, Draw a through line for me from these conventions to the foundation of the NAACP. Um, were these conventions, were they organized and connected to each other, um, either, either loosely or, or maybe even officially? Um, what, was the, what was the connection between all these conventions that were happening? And then what's the history that, that has this leading to the NAACP? Jim, why don't you take the connection and I'll take the, the NAA, the, the more direct NAACP. Sound okay? Uh, sure. Um, it's a great question in part because it's not quite an apples to apples sort of comparison. One of the things that makes the convention movement so interesting is that there was a really kind of distributed quality to it where people in a given community, state or region could sort of call for and then convene their own convention. And so there were many attempts during the years after the Civil War and the decades to follow when people began to form national organizations, for example, the National Equal Rights League, which was head headquartered for a period of time here in Pennsylvania, um, labor unions, sort of professional associations for people like farmers and teachers and, and newspaper workers. Um, but this is a kind of constantly sort of moving sort of set of goals. And so one of the sort of later qualities of the national movements um, are real sort of attempts to try and create sort of enduring institutions to create things that could last sort of beyond the moment um, of people responding to a particular sort of organization. Um, and so when we get to the 1890s, there's a huge number of people who are engaged in so many ways already in these kinds of activities, if not formally within a particular one institution. And I think that's the real sort of transition um, in part towards looking towards some of the movements that would really sort of take hold in the 20th century. Great. that also links the NAACP, the founding of the NAACP itself, and the color convention movement that, um, that, that Illinois, uh, again, to follow, it's, it's actually a little bit eerie how similar um, these um, events are. Um, 2,000 African Americans, about 2,000 African Americans, families and community members are, are targeted in Springfield. Gabrielle, your, your internet, you're breaking up a little bit on us. I'm not sure if you're hearing me clearly now, but uh, you're breaking up coming through on us. Nope. Jim, no. Sure, I can, I can um, uh, maybe just briefly summarize in, in part to say that one of the constants that we see when we study the history of black social movements, of protest movements, of community organizing, um, are these moments when people gather together to respond to sort of particular escalations, particular sort of moments um, of attack and, and incursions on the rights and safety of Black communities. Um, this is, of course, what we see in the sort of earliest years in 1829 and 1830. It's also part of what we see in what is oftentimes called the nadir of American history, the sort of real, you know, sort of um, epidemic of lynchings in the American South and North and West um, in the 1890s. Um, if Gabrielle's microphone is back on, she can pick up from here. Um, 
But this, you know, this is one of the things that helps to inspire the need for organizations like the NAACP, like what helps to inspire some of the early message, excuse me, early arms of the civil rights movement as well. Gabrielle, do you want to? No, but it's still, it's still breaking up. It's um, it might be, it might be your internet connection. So I, I apologize. We are running out of time. I have uh, a lot more questions to get to, but uh, why don't we wrap up with uh, Jim maybe sharing how people can find out some more information. I know we've shared the links, but let's go ahead and remind folks about the links and about Douglas Day. Uh, sure, and maybe I'll start off by saying thank you uh, to Paul, Lisa, and all the other folks who helped to organize this, this um, event today. We so wish that we could be with everybody in person, but perhaps being virtual lets us uh, get to be in, in uh, community with all the other folks who are out there. Um, we would love to hear from you and everybody out there. Uh, please follow us. We're especially active on Twitter at CCP underscore org, um, at Douglas Day org. Um, all of our websites have lots and lots of information. Uh, including tons of resources um, and places to disappear down the rabbit hole. In the next year or so, we're going to be launching new crowdsourcing efforts where we're going to be throwing the doors wide open uh, for folks to be able to come and help us recover and relearn some of these histories. Um, we're going to be developing many of these sort of programs um, and opportunities within the context of the Center for Black Digital Research, uh, newly established here uh, with our partners in the Penn State Libraries, uh, and the College of Liberal Arts here at University Park, uh, along with lots of partners across the Commonwealth. Um, one of the real joys and, and um, sort of energizing qualities as Gabrielle and I have moved to Penn State is the opportunity to work with so many incredible, talented, dedicated folks um, across so many different parts um, of Penn State. Um, so we're delighted to be able to get to meet folks, hopefully soon and very soon in person um, as we all get to be together. Um, once again, we're looking forward to being able to continue the longer sort of arc of all of this work together um, here at Penn State. Well, Gabrielle and Jim, thank you so much for joining us. And to all of you who are joining us on Zoom, thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional speaker sessions in the coming weeks and months. And this programming is in addition to a wide array of online networking and career programs that are available throughout the year. You can find a full listing of our events on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again, and we are Penn State.